Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us on our webinar on a guide to cash flow management and update on the coronavirus job retention scheme. I am David Smith, Managing Partner of MHA Henderson Loggy. I'll shortly introduce our five presenters this morning and what guidance and further insight they will give you in line with this morning's agenda, which is on the screen. Uh, the webinar will last approximately 90 minutes, depending on questions. But I, I, th I thought I would first share a few thoughts about the crisis and thoughts about how we all get to the other side. Um, this is what we've done as a firm, and I've followed a similar structure for discussions and giving advice when I've been catching up with clients in, in the recent weeks and to business leaders to see how they're managing through the crisis. Everyone I've spoken to is affected by the situation, or if they're not impacted yet, they can see the impact coming later in 2020 or into 2021. There are different degrees of severity being felt too. Therefore, what, what each business needs to do will vary on your own specific situation. But you know, to, to give yourself a bit of a structure, it's important to have a strong handle on where you are now. That's financially, your cash position, revenue position, your burn rate of cash. What immediate decisions do you have to make? I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have, have made a number of those decisions already, but what's the next immediate decisions you have to make? What are your key challenges? And make sure you're focusing on the core issues and not the surrounding symptoms. What are the urgent concerns that are really impacting you? But don't forget the opportunities as well. Where is the potential for you and your business? You need to look at where you're trying to get to too. And for most businesses just now, that's really just to get the other side of the crisis with a viable business. As part of that look into the future, it's important to consider different scenarios. Um, what we did in our business and we've been doing with a number of clients is looking at a low severity where it's almost business as usual, a medium severity with maybe a 20% loss of revenue and high severity kind of disaster planning if, if the impacts more than 50% of the business. And doing this is really important for the projections, especially if you're applying for business interruption uh, loans as well. But most of your time should be focused on how you're going to get from the current situation to get to the other side. And that's tackling those urgent issues for the next seven days, for the next 30 days, and even you'll be thinking as we are, what's the urgent uh, issues we need to tackle today? Think about if the severity escalates, what are you going to do? Look at waste in your business. How much cost can you remove? What are the risks? What are the risks of working remotely and, and ensuring that, that you don't fall foul of, of non-compliance or, or, or drop in client service? And how are you going to mitigate them? But also consider growth. Where are the opportunities for you? You should build all this into a resilient plan to get you through the next 90 days. But you may find that you need a plan that just gets you through the next 30 days and just keep building it and get, get yourself to the other side. I think what's really important as well, and what, what we found with clients and, and within our own business, you really need to communicate that plan to everyone in the team, everyone in the business, and to your key stakeholders as well. So we, we've got the agenda on the screen. I've covered a little bit there about, about scenario planning and think about different things for your own business. But also on the agenda, we've got our first presenter will be Rod Mathers, who is our Head of Corporate Finance at MHA Henderson Loggy. Rod will give his thoughts on protecting your business and maintaining viability to get to the other side of the crisis. He'll look at support under the Business Support Fund. He'll look at the Business Interruption Loan Scheme, commonly abbreviated to CBILS, and he'll also cover practical advice to manage cash flow. Next up will be Alan Davis, our firm's chairman and head of VAT. Alan will cover 
practical steps with VAT to manage cash flow, including the VAT deferral payment scheme, time to pay arrangements with HMRC, practical use of tax points for VAT, bad debt relief for VAT, and we'll also consider other potential retrospective claims to help with your cash flow. Then we'll have Shona Campbell, head of our business recovery and insolvency team. And Shona will look at restructuring ideas for businesses facing financial pressures and advice for business leaders who don't know what to do. In her restructuring role, she helps businesses come up with solutions to get business back to health, both financial health and also operationally. Fiona Doctor will follow Shona. Fiona is our HR director. She'll be giving some insight about further guidance that could be released in the coming days. And we'll also consider workforce planning as you start thinking about the business coming out the other side of the crisis and as the furlough scheme comes to an end, what does the business look like with, with your team coming back in to the business? And our last presenter is Avril Craig, our payroll manager at the firm. Now, Avril spoke in detail about the coronavirus job retention scheme in our webinar last week. A video of that webinar is available to watch on our website. And from that webinar, we've also got an extensive section of frequently asked questions in our guidance on the website. So, so please to look at that too. Avril will re-emphasise important points for you this morning to help you understand the furlough job retention scheme, what you as employers have to do and what to expect. After Avril's section, there'll be time for a, a live question and answer session. So you can type any questions that you have in there and, and, and we, we can look to answer them as, as we progress through, through the webinar. So only the speakers will be able to see your questions. So you can ask questions anonymously and you should be able to find the speech bubble icon in the top right hand uh, side of the screen so you can type your questions. Um, so, um, on to Rod next, if Rod, Rod, you want to pick up on your section. Thanks, David. Uh, and morning, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rod Mathers. I'm a partner on MHA Anderson Logie and I head up the, uh, the firm's corporate finance team, as David said. Uh, now, under normal circumstances, I, I would typically be working with business owners uh, who are either looking to sell their business or prepare for, for a sale or acquire a business or raise equity or, or debt finance. However, uh, in these uh, unprecedented times, uh, the focus for many company owners and directors is to really protect their own business uh, and to take steps to ensure that when they get to the other side of this crisis, they have a, a viable business going forward. Um, so as David said, I'm going to talk about three things this morning. Uh, firstly, the support that the government is providing under the Coronavirus Business Support Fund. Secondly, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. Uh, and finally, I'll give you some practical advice on how to, to manage cash flow during these uh, difficult times. So the Coronavirus um, Business Support Fund is administered by local authorities on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, and it's grant funding, which is very helpful. So it's not loans, you don't have to repay them. Uh, and the support typically typically um, provides three things. One, uh, full years, 100% non-domestic rates relief for retail, hospitality and tourism. Um, £10,000 grants for small business in receipt of the small business bonus scheme or uh, who, who qualify for rural relief. Uh, and thirdly, £25,000 grants for hospitality, leisure and retail businesses for properties with rateable value between £18,000 and £51,000. Um, so as I understand it, the application process is fairly straightforward um, and eligible ratepayers should apply to the local authority using the, the application forms that are typically online. And I think the closing date is the end of March 2021. Um, so a further £220 million of grant support was announced only yesterday um, to be made available for, for small businesses and the recently self-employed, which, which is very helpful. Uh, so the new package includes £120 million um, to extend the small business grant scheme to ensure 
that in addition to 100% grant in the first property, small businesses uh, and ratepayers can, can be eligible for 75% grant on, on subsequent properties. Uh, and these new arrangements will be in place uh, by the 5th of May. And then a further £100 million is being made available to protect um, self-employed people and viable micro and SME businesses in distress. Uh, de details will, will follow uh, and applications, I believe, can be made at the end of the month. So some very helpful free money from the government, which you should take full advantage of. So moving on to the, the business interruption loan schemes. Uh, now this was this was one of the major support initiatives for business introduced by government uh, and is in the form of a guarantee which is made available to banks to support and encourage them um, to provide loans to, to business. Now initially two, two schemes were announced. Um, firstly, the COVID corporate financing facility which was aimed at larger investment grade companies. Um, and secondly, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, uh, and, uh, which, is refer which I'll refer to as C-bills, and that provides loans of up to five million pounds and aimed at companies with turnover of up to 45 million pounds. Subsequently, the Chancellor announced uh, an additional scheme for companies with turnover of between 45 million and 500 million to borrow up to 25 million pounds and again largely guaranteed by the government. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'll focus on C-bills as you know, this is likely to be the most relevant for, for, for Scottish SME businesses and, and, and those on the call this morning. So as I said, C-bills um, is available for businesses if you turn over up to 45 million um, and you can access loans, overdrafts, invoice finance and asset finance facilities up to five million pounds and for up to six years. Um, the good news is the government covers the first 12 months of interest payments and any fees, therefore there's no upfront costs for the borrower. So the government typically would provide the lender with a guarantee of 80% of each loan um, to give lenders a confidence to, su to support the business. So I'm sure you'd be thinking about whether, you know, if you're thinking about applying for a, for a loan under the scheme, whether you, you'll be asked for a personal guarantee. Um, and I can confirm that um, the, the banks won't take personal guarantees in any, on any form um, for loans under £250,000, which is good news. Uh, and for, for facilities above £250,000, PGs may be required at the lender's discretion. However, you should note that that would exclude your principal private residence, so you can sleep easy, easy um, knowing that your home is safe. Uh, and secondly, recoveries are capped at a maximum of 20% of any outstanding balance on the C-Bills facility after proceeds of uh, the sale of business assets have been applied. So if you're thinking about applying for a loan uh, under C-Bills, the banks will initially assess any application um, based on its normal commercial lending criteria and therefore being granted a loan is not actually an automatic right. Um, it's therefore important uh, that you submit a strong lending proposal uh, and I, I recommend it should include five key features. So firstly, a commentary supported by financial analysis demonstrating that you had a sound business prior to COVID-19. I think that's, that's critical. Um, a clear description of how COVID-19 has impacted your business. Thirdly, the self-help self measures you've taken to address the current trading difficulties. Fourthly, a description of how the business will look post COVID-19 and how the C-Bills loan will help you achieve this transition. Uh, and finally, and importantly, a forward plan clearly demonstrating that you have a viable business going forward and one that can actually support um, the debt service on any existing debt and any additional debt. And that's, that's important for you to be comfortable um, that you're able to service the debt going forward. So di different banks request slightly different information, but in my experience, a minimum, uh, you know, should prepare three sets of cash flows and similar to, to David explained um, and they should be prepared on a, on a monthly basis and over a period of 12 months um, and that will allow the short term impact of the business to be demonstrated but will also show the bank that over a period of time medium term that you'll be able to get your business back to semi-normality or hopefully normality. So I think the three scenarios that you should be looking at is, is business as usual so that's um, no impact of COVID-19 um, and that would typically be a normal base case budget. The second one would be that business as usual scenario, but showing the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and thirdly, 
a scenario incorporating your cash management and self-help measures. Now you may you may not choose to, to share the second scenario with your bank as it may not look very pretty, um, but it's important for you to understand what the real downside might be. Um, but I would roll this into scenario three, uh, which will be used for the purposes of, of your presentation to your, to your bank. So as I said, approval is not automatic and therefore uh, you, should, you should seek appropriate financial advice prior to submitting any proposal um, and therefore that, you know, that will, will maximise the chance of, of success. So I don't propose to go through the detail of the various schemes, but um, these can be found on our website under the, the support and advice for business section. So next year I want to talk about today is cash flow management, uh, which I'm sure is the uh, top priority or one of the top priorities for everybody. Um, and some of the practical steps that you can take uh, to manage cash flow during this difficult period. Possibly, probably one of the most relevant sayings in the current environment is cash is king. Absolutely true. And it's critical that um, you as business owners and managers are right on top of your current and short term cash position. I've already outlined some of the support measures that the government are offering. Um, however, you can't simply rely on the support and you must be proactive. And if there's one piece of advice to give today is be proactive um, in navigating your way through the, the current situation. So in my opinion, there are four, four areas that you really should be focusing on in the short term. The first one, um, prepare a short term daily or weekly cash flow to clearly establish your current working capital position. Um, and to identify what levers that you can pull to remain within your facilities. Secondly, manage all stakeholders to the business. The business. Um, you may have many stakeholders, all equally important, so getting them on the same page is critical, but might be challenging given that they, they have competing interests. Um, thirdly, once you have the comfort in your short term position, consider what medium term funding that you might require to support your business during and, and after COVID-19, and that might include a, a C-bills loan. And then finally, uh, and, and importantly, be aware, uh, think very carefully about your director's responsibilities uh, and consider the implications on creditors uh, of any decisions that you make. Shona Campbell will we'll talk later on a wee bit about stakeholder management and director's responsibilities. Um, but if I can then maybe share with you some practical tips on how to manage cash flow in the short term. So as I said, it's critical that you fully appreciate and understand your current cash position and uh, have a clear picture of your funding requirement. So uh, yeah, I believe you should maintain a simple cash flow that quickly identifies your immediate needs and can be easily flexed based on changing circumstances day to day. So I said before, before I joined MHA Henderson Logie, I, I held senior finance positions in, in a few companies um, who are facing cash challenges. That was just after the, the last crisis in 2007. So I've therefore, I've you know, been, in, been in the trenches, been on the other side of the table, uh, and, and I'm happy to share some of these experiences today or, or after this call. And you know, during, during that period, uh, a constant companion of mine was a 13-week rolling cash flow model. Um, so much so that my wife accused me uh, many times of spending more time with the cash flow model than with her. Um, but I, you know, I, it was a constant companion. Uh, I used it daily uh, and it helped, it helped me and some of the companies I worked with uh, get through the other side. Um, so typically I would update the model weekly on a Friday night or a Monday morning and circulate that to the wider senior management team and the board. Um, this approach you know, ensures that you as managing director or as finance director uh, are not burdened solely with the responsibility of, of keeping cash on the right side of the line. Uh, and there was one situation where the former finance director did take that responsibility on and didn't share it with other members of the team um, and it didn't work out well at all. So really important to, to, to look at it as a, as a team effort. Um, <clears throat> so the 13 week cash flow allows and directs other people to um, take specific mitigating action during the coming week. So I would typically hold a, a meeting on a Wednesday um, and that allowed uh, and made sure that all actions were being followed up. And it also acts as a forum to, to share some ideas and thoughts and, and, and to come up with some, um, some, some good ideas to, to, um, to mitigate cash. Um, I would typically make it mandatory so everybody needed to be there um, that was asked um, and it should solely focus on cash management because it's easy to, to, to stray into other areas. So some of the specific cash management measures that you'd consider, um, so requesting a payment holiday or temporary increase from your, your bank, 
um, release some equity from unencumbered or part unencumbered assets from your HP provider, uh, agreeing extended payment terms from suppliers, including your landlord, uh, renegotiating customer contracts, uh, and maybe insisting on payments up front. Um, you should consider time to pay arrangements with HMRC, um, and Alan Davis will, will talk through some of the other uh, actions that you can take around VAT uh, in terms of cash flow a bit later on. Um, you should also consider staff levels and the impact of utilising the government's new job retention scheme. Um, you should consider deferral of payments to shareholders, directors, senior staff as appropriate, uh, and potentially deferring any current one-off um, project related costs. So I think the important thing is by maintaining this model and, sh and, and sharing it with some of your stakeholders, you can actually demonstrate that you're in control of, of your short term cash position um, and you know, getting getting the stakeholders comfort that you're on top of the top of the business is, is really important. So I would stress that some of these measures are simply delaying payments. So please be mindful that these liabilities will need to be settled at, at some point in the future and you're not just storing up a bigger problem for later. Um, and this is where it's important to recognise your responsibilities as, as directors, uh, which I said Sean will cover later on. Uh, so I've actually I've prepared a very simple cash flow model, um, which is free to use and it's available on our website. So um, it's under the cash management support section. Um, there's two versions, one with and one without an invoice finance facility. So please, uh, please access it and contact me if you need any guidance on, on how to use it. So in summary, I'd suggest four key impo very important do's and don'ts when it comes to cash flow management. So do get on top of and keep on top of your short term cash position by using a simple model. Do manage your stakeholders and communicate with them regularly. Do share the burden with your management team and do seek advice when you need it. However, don't stick your head in the sand on a bucket. Very important that you address the situation. Don't procrastinate take informed action quickly. Importantly, don't kid yourself and don't don't kid yourself on and don't kid on other members of the management team. It's really important um, um, that you do understand the position and share it and everyone's aware of the, the current situation. Uh, and finally, don't be afraid to face the challenge head on um, and with confidence. So to finish in a, in a slight positive, when you get to the other side of this situation, because of all the actions that you've taken, because you've really looked closely at your business, then hopefully you'll actually come out the other side with a more efficient and more, more, more effective business. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'll now pass you over to my colleague, Alan Davis, who will walk you through some of the um, specific opportunities to improve VAT cash flow on your business. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, Rod. Um, as, as, as Rod's alluded to, there, there are a number of things you can do, and what I'm going to do is drill down into some of the practical steps that you can do um, in the in the world of VAT that will help you in terms of cash flow. Um, as David started out um, his general introduction, um, I'm going to cover the automatic deferral payment scheme, um, VAT time to pay arrangements, and the use of tax points and accruals, bad debt relief, um, and going back and looking to see if there's any um, additional VAT that you can recover on your purchase side that you maybe have, have in good times not really focused on, but in, in bad times you need to look back on and, and see if there's more to be got there. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first item there, and, and it should be reasonably well publicised and you should be reasonably well aware of, is the automatic delayed um, back payment arrangements that HMRC or the government um, announced um, on the 20th of March. Um, a fairly unprecedented um, relief from um, paying your VAT bills um, that effectively says that for the period from the 20th of March to the 30th of June 2020, um, you can defer paying any VAT that's due in that period up until the 31st of March 2021. So that's a fairly extended period of, of credit um, and that's going to affect um, returns that will be due on the 7th of April, so obviously that's past, that's February returns, the 7th of May, which are the March returns, and the 7th of June, which are April returns. You could actually file um, a return early um, and create a liability before that and, and, and bring forward a, a liability. Um, so that if you've got, a, 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 for example, a May return, 
submit that before the end of June as a payment, and that payment will then um, fall into the, the deferment period. Um, the deferment um, applies to any payments on account for large businesses. So if you've got a, a, a monthly payment to make on account, um, that's covered um, by the deferral period. And also the annual accounting scheme is, is caught by the, the deferment, so you can use that for that. One of the key things to um, not lose sight of in this is that many people pay VAT by direct debit um, and HMRC don't have the facility to cancel those direct debits um, very quickly. So it's down to you to make sure that um, your direct debits are cancelled before your due date or customs will naturally take it and you'll have missed the opportunity to, to get into that um, deferral. Um, again, something else not to lose sight of is you still buy to actually send in your returns, render the returns, even though there's a payment that you're not going to make on it. Um, they still need to know how much that will be. Um, and the other thing is to remember, and, and I think Rod mentioned it, it, it's not going to go away. It's just deferred. So um, be aware that, that come March there will be a reckoning and there'll be a, a payment to be made. Um, on the direct debit point, um, just again, something not to think, not to forget, is that having cancelled um, the current periods, um, you'll you'll be back into the swing of paying back routinely um, after June, unless things change, um, and you'll need to either restart your direct debits or remember to make a direct payment um, to HMRC um, as it falls due. Um, I suppose the the other thing to mention on that is that whilst it applies to normal VAT return payments, it doesn't apply to things like payments under MOS, the one-stop accounting for um, electronically supplied services, for any assessments that HMRC have raised on you, or any um, pre-existing time to pay arrangements. They can't be um, re renegotiated per se um, under the, the general um, delayed payments arrangements. Um, so that's the kind of the, the automatic thing and that was that was widely welcomed in the business fraternity um, because obviously it gave a bit of certainty and it gave you a bit of a planning in terms of when your that that payment will be due. Um, if if payment is still a difficulty um, in VAT terms, um, you could seek also what um, customs call time to pay. Um, and so you can do that for uh, VAT assessments or any other liabilities that accrue. So, for example, if you you know end up in September and you can't do your um, make your, your September payment, you could seek a, a specific um, pre-approved um, time to pay arrangement with customs um, so that that liability can be taken care of. And one thing that, that is fairly new on the on Friday last week, Easter Friday, um, they announced that the time to pay arrangement could be uh, extended to customs duty um, and VAT imports. So if you have a deferment account, um, the um, ability to defer that payment um, was brought into um, time to pay again with a specific application rather than a blanket approach. So you need to go to customs and say uh, and make specific arrangements. So what will they need to know? Um, well, when you're going to them, you obviously need to have your VAT number to hand, how much VAT you're due or tax that's due and payable, um, what you've done to, to try and get the money um, to, to pay the bills. So that they're not naturally going to roll over and say, well, here's the money or, or, or we'll let you off with it. But they need to understand what, what efforts you've made. Um, and then how much, what the plan is, how much you can pay immediately and how long you're going to need to pay the balance. And very often it's a question of even if you can make a relatively small payment up front, that gets them over the line in terms of agreeing something and gets you on the, the road to a, a, an agreement. And if you're making the call to, to try and get that agreement, um, the, the your bank account details are important as well, so you need to have those to hand. They will talk through your income and expenditure, um, the assets and investments, any savings the business might have, so that they're, they're really kind of drilling into, you know, how, do you really need this um, facility? Um, and, and to kind of understand what you're doing, as, as Rob Rod outlined, what, what you're doing to get things back in order. That can be done on the, on the telephone with customs. Um, the numbers are busy, um, so don't ex make yourself a cup of tea and get yourself comfortable while you're making the call. Um, the number's on our website, but I'll read it out just once um, just now. It's 0300 200 3835. 
So that's the um, time to pay. That's the one that you need to get um, prior approval. For. So those are the two fairly obvious ones that have cropped up um, since this um, these events have taken place. Um, the other ones are around. The other points are around um, general good housekeeping of VAT. So the first is um, tax points and accruals. Um, we know that VAT um, is normally due on sales um, at the earliest point of payment or invoice or the supply being um, made. And in this respect, what you might try and do is, is um, if you're um, issuing invoices normally, you might issue a request for payment rather than a back invoice, and that doesn't create a tax point, even if you've got a, a period of um, time before people will pay you. You might consider whether you still qualify for cash accounting, um, and that's if your turnover is less than 1.35 million, you'll qualify, and that in that case, you can uh, you're, you're only liable to pay VAT on your sales when you're paid. Um, and if you're making um, continuous supplies of services, in other words, you've got a contract with somebody and you just generally um, provide services and bill when you're ready, um, the, the, the tax point there is when you raise the bill. So be, be aware of that and, and potentially use requests for payments to avoid a, a tax point being created. On the input tax side, on purchases, um, the obvious thing is to maximise um, claims to input tax, um, utilising um, any accruals that you can do. So, you know, if there's literally any invoices lying about waiting for approval of a, a director somewhere, make sure that's in gathered and, and um, added to your claim. The one um, caveat I'd give on that is that under the cir current circumstances, in the period where there's automatic deferment, <coughs> excuse me, arguably you should be making sure you've got as much tax to pay as possible. So if, for example, you furloughed your um, accounts payable team, um, the, the process of, of putting on your payments onto your system might be slower. Um, and that's helpful in the short term because that will reduce your claim, make your payment um, in, the, in the deferment period bigger. Um, and that's, that gets you that bit extra deferment on a, on a bigger number until March 21. Um, so that's you know just being aware of that tax point um, issue and the accrual accrual point, bringing forward any any VAT that you can recover, um, even if it then makes it a claim. Claims are still being repaid as normal, so if you can create a claim, a valid claim, then then you should try and do that. Um, bad debt relief is the next theme. Um, there is a facility that if you haven't been paid um, after um, six months and you, you um, park the, the debt in a bad debt relief account in your accounts, then you can claim uh, bad debt relief um, on your next VAT return. So very much um, in the theme of, of what Rod talked about, taking that kind of regular look at your accounts, writing off debts as quickly as possible um, and taking bad debt relief at the, at the six month um, deadline will we'll bring forward some, some relief on that. Um, and then the final one was around um, seeing if there's actually anything, any more VAT in your business that's already there that you haven't really historically um, uh, drilled down to. There's a couple of areas where we quite often see clients um, typically don't have the time to, to, to get onto, um, but now might be the time. So things like um, employee expenses, um, have um, have you maximised all the VAT that's been incurred by your employees while they're out doing your business? Um, things like fuel bills, um, hotel bills, um, and similar you know, parking costs, stuff like that. And the other one is is international VAT. So if you have client, if you have employees who go to conferences or um, events overseas, particularly in the EU, there is a, a, a reclaim mechanism for VAT that's been incurred there. So if you've um, had hotel bills, hire cars, things like that, there is a reclaim facility there um, and that can um, give you a, 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 not only a cash flow benefit, it'll give you a one-off um, windfall benefit. Um, for um, EU countries, um, the, the claim year is up to the end of December, um, but the claim must be within or submitted by the 30th of September each year. So 30th of September 20 will be the, the deadline for claims for the year to December 19. So that's um, kind of key headline things there. On our website, um, we've gone into the top 10 um, cash flow benefits that you can do. 
uh, look at. Those are the, the, the top four or five. Um, there's a, a number of other ones that, that really help you focus on, on VAT as a, as a means of managing your cash flow um, and that can really kind of practically help the business rather than just talking about looking after cash flow generally. Um, so that's where I'm at um, with, the, with the, the, the key takeaways really. The automatic pension, uh, pension deferment scheme, the time to pay um, agreements that you need to go um, discuss with HMRC, tax points and accruals, bad debt relief, and you know, is there anything else in terms of input tax? Um, I did have one of the two of the little, little um, VAT twists, not necessarily on, on cash flow, um, but on the um, the receipt of job, job retention money and any grants and so on. Um, we've had some questions coming in about the VAT liability of that. There is no VAT on those, so they're, they're completely separate and, and there shouldn't be VAT on those. Um, and the other little um, angle was around um, equipment being gifted or, or, or donated to NHS or other charities. So um, PPE equipment, for example, if it's something that you do um, manufacture and, and then you're giving it away free, there is a VAT issue there that, that obviously you've had VAT back on the costs of making the items, um, but you're giving them away free and make, not making a sale. So. Um, if that's something that you're involved with, I'd suggest that you um, perhaps get in contact directly or at least think about that as a, as a potential issue. So that's the world of VAT as it's uh, moving along just now. I'm going to hand you over now to my colleague um, Shona Campbell, who heads up our um, restructuring team, and she's going to talk about restructuring methods. Hi. So as David Rod and Alan have all provided some really tangible advice and, and, and tips. And after me, there's some more to come on the coronavirus job retention scheme and payroll and workforce workforce planning. Um, so do I bring to the party. I'm a insolvency practitioner. That means I'm licensed by the government to act as a liquidator, uh, administrator of, of companies and also act in personal insolvency, so to bankruptcies. Um, Q, lots of jokes about wearing black and carrying a size. Most business owners think they don't want to speak to me. They think that if they speak to me, they will end up in insolvency. But I speak to businesses and individuals every week, providing them with advice. And, um, you know, they, they may not technically be insolvent, but they're facing financial pressures, uh, which they're struggling to find a way through. These businesses are facing different issues, different levels of pressure, but most of the businesses I speak to don't end up going bust. Sometimes there is an insolvency um, and sometimes in those insolvencies there's a business that comes out the other side. Um, so this is the, the, the restructuring side of, of what I do. Um, and today I'm going to speak about sort of that in, in interim restructuring methods. Um, restructuring is a process that aims to ensure that businesses that are struggling can be made profitable in return to healthy cash flow. Very broadly, it can take two forms, uh, financial restructuring, where a business looks to restructure the, the debts, um, the liabilities that it owes to its creditors, uh, and operational restructuring, where the business looks to change the way it's structured or how it works. Unlike insolvency procedures, a license isn't needed to provide insolvency uh, restructuring advice, but advisors tend to come from an insolvency background or law or an accountancy. So I've got a background about, about all three. So at the moment, what we're facing is it's unprecedented. Um, the cause is the same for everyone and many impacts to individuals and businesses are similar, but each and every business will be facing its own unique set of circumstances and, and therefore different options and solutions. Some people have a perception that this is something that is happening to them and this is out of their control. But remember, there are always things that you can control and there's always decisions that you can make. Um, you know, Rod just gave you his, his don'ts, you know, don't stick your head in the sand, don't kid yourself on, don't be afraid to, to face the challenge head on with confidence. You know, the worst thing you can do sometimes is, is nothing. So you're facing challenges in your business that you've never faced before, struggling with what to do. And I, you know, I don't have the answer, but what I to have is the mythology um, and I'm outlining to you the sort of the six key steps in um, restructuring and it, you know if, if I'm formally engaged in a restructuring process 
broadly, this is this is what they all they all look like. The, the, the six the six steps of it. So first step is where are you now? What is the current position? And uh, the key part to this is the is the cash flow that 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 Rod talked you through. A thirteen week cash flow. Why thirteen weeks? Well, thirteen weeks is three months. It includes your quarterly payments. You know, like. Uh, rent or that quite often are, are those um, and it's um, far enough ahead in general terms of what we're, we're used to to be reasonably accurate in the normal the normal course um, and if you look at where we are we are now you know hopefully that uh, a 12 week cash flow would get us past uh, and um, to, to some semblance of normality we can look at what's, what's going to happen in Germany and, and France uh, and if you start to make cash flow, you'll need to make some assumptions, and that is that is difficult because it's again unprecedented. David talked about his his sort of three three scenarios there, um, and then the other part of where you are now is what are your assets and liabilities, and that is to list them all, because what I quite often find is that businesses, a business owner doesn't have all the liabilities listed down, thinks they know what they are, thinks they know what the number is, but Quite often, it's it's not the same as, as, as what is actually the the full extent of it. So the the next the next step in, in restructuring is to look at how long have we got, uh, and and that that's your your cash flow. Rate. There may be some um, event at some point that that, but you that is your your timeline, your your platform, your your runway. How long have we got, and and. Um, Therefore, there'll be certain things that you just can't do with it with the time that you have. And then the the next step here is to look at your options. Um, just list them down as many as you can think of. Some of them will be little things. Some of them will be big things. They're not mutually exclusive. You know, some options can work together. You can mix and match them. So you list those all down. And then the next step is to look at the pros and cons of the options. Um, uh, and just again to list list those down, which leads you on to step five, which is pick one or more. You know, like I say, there, you, you can run more than one in tandem. I also recommend to have a contingency plan, so it's your backup. What what actually, if if, if plan A doesn't work, then what, what's plan B look like? And then the, the, the sixth step is is to, to implement it, is to is to do it. Um, and you know, that's where often. In the with the, the work that I do at the level of financial structure, sometimes that implementation does involve an, an insolvency event. But you know there may be some business that comes out the other, the other side of that. So a quick recap then on the, the six steps. There is the first slide: assess what your current position is, um, including the cash flow. Second, um, assess whether there is a burning platform. What's your what's your time scale? Then look at what your options. Look at the pros and cons of each option. Uh, think about a contingency, uh, implement your plan. Um, and then the, the next thing I'm going to speak about is um, the, the, the two things that you need to continually monitor and check on in any restructuring restructuring process while you undertake that. And the first one is, is, is cash management. And that goes back to that 13 week cash flow. You need to regularly keep that updated, extend it out, monitor it, tweak it, see what you can mitigate. Um, uh, broad, broad covered that, so I'm not going to go Go into that anymore. But the, the second thing is stakeholder engagement, um, and every business has different different stakeholders, um, and every business will have a different key stakeholders. You know whether that's a, a lender, a landlord, um, there'll be suppliers, customers, governments, employees, uh, and that's you need to regularly keep them updated. Tell them where where you are, what what you're doing. Tell them that you're you're doing it. Telling telling them how how it's going, what the what the progress is, because with your with your stakeholders, if they have a um, you know, an information vacuum, then they, they fear the worst and they they may take precipitate action that that will be harmful for for your business. You know, with with an employee. You know, they, they're, they're one of your, your key stakeholders as well, and you know, whereby you say, well, it might be challenging for them to find another job at the moment. As you know, it's, it's not the case that that will apply to, to everyone. So keep them updated and let them know what's what's going on. Um, so the next the next part of what I'm going to talk to you about is um, I just thought you might be interested to hear in some of the advice that I'm currently giving to um, 
to businesses that I'm speaking to. And I've had I've had two catch ups recently with other groups of insolvency practitioners. Um, uh, one one was this this morning, and I think what what we're all seeing is that it's, it's quite similar the position that we find ourselves in, and there's a perception at the moment that we are really busy and there's liquidations right, left, and centre. You know, I was asked to give a comment um, for Business Insider a magazine last week. I was saying it's just it, there's no influx of insolvencies at the moment. There's no big massive amount of liquidations going on. There are a lot of businesses that are um, that are really struggling and are not sure what they what they can do. And there, there's a few businesses that there that has been some insolvencies, but that's where the business hasn't been viable for a long period of time. And this is the, fi the, the final straw, um, and they just can't get get through this without um, going to take steps to formally appoint an insolvency practitioner. They're in the minority, doing lots of inquiries, giving lots of advice, um, and but we're not we're not actually taking on a lot of new new what new formal insolvency engagements and most insolvency practitioners that I've spoken to have furloughed staff so you know the, there is there isn't a huge amount of work there and we're not expecting there to be a huge amount of insolvencies in the short term but what we are we are seeing is um, talking to businesses that are concerned about the future, talking them through their options, helping them to pull together cash flows you know Rod's, Rod's doing as well and um, helping them access some of the government support that, that's there. It's um businesses are concerned about the future. There is it is very easy for for most businesses to tread water at the moment. Um, you know, sort of like mothball, minimise outgoings, do what you can to protect your, your core business. There's forbearance from from lenders and suppliers. Enforcement action um, from the creditors is very unlikely, particularly because in Scotland the courts are closed to that sort of business at the moment. Chef officers are also not delivering the statutory demands that they might normally do. So, the, the, you know, there's a wide selection of government support there. It does give a good chance for survival. So, you know, take some advice, speak to your trusted advisor, just take notes of decisions when when you're making them and what what you're what you're doing. Keep an eye on your cash flow. Be mindful of your director's duties um, and on director's duties one of the most common concerns that i speak to people about is wrongful trading um, and there's been some uh, governments made an announcement um, that effectively says that it, what wrongful trading is is that uh, where directors know or should have known that insolvency is the likely outcome for the business they should take steps to ensure that the loss to creditors is is minimised, and if they don't do so, then the directors may be held personally liable for the shortfall to the creditors and insolvency. So it's personal liability for the directors that comes out. It could be their own assets. Government made a press release 29th of March that said they intend to amend insolvency law to give companies breathing space uh, to keep trading whilst they explore the options for rescue. And, and that is, is about very little detail in the in the main announcement. But the, what the note said was that current insolvency rules stipulate that directors of limited liability companies can be liable for the business debts if they can take about whether the continue to be. And realization of these wrongful trading rules will reassure directors that difficult decisions that they have to make about the future viability of the business will not have to be unduly influenced by the exceptional circumstances which are, are beyond their control. So, like suspension to wrongful trading is going to be introduced shortly, backdated to the 1st of March, and it's a breathing space to, to company directors of, of businesses to, you know, to look at what the options to access support packages and and to survive the pandemic, um, so it's clear that the governments don't want businesses to take precipitate action. And you know, I say going through that the, the six restructuring, restructuring steps, it's, it's all about assessing where you and to do it. Um, now I know that some of the people on this call are not limited companies, um, that we sold trade are self-employed who already have that sort of personal liability is already there and, and that, that must be something that's been very, very heavily on their mind. So just thought I'd also mention another change that's been introduced. It's a moratorium for, for six months that for individuals who are, um, 
you know, facing financial financial pressures can apply for a moratorium for, for six months. It's not been, it has been introduced now, it's previously for six weeks. And, and this purpose, um, it's, it's the, the government guidance again, it's about reducing stress and protecting the mental health of those worried about the prospect of creditor enforcement during this time of increased uncertainty. And it's about, again, giving time for options to be considered properly before potentially irreversible decisions are, are taken. Um, so, and this is about protecting individuals whose the financial problems are as a direct result of COVID-19 um, and the financials will normalise after after the pandemic. So that sort of summarises, that's it. That's what I want to speak about. Now uh, I to to Avril Craig, who is our head of payroll at Henshaw Longy, and she's going to speak to you about the coronavirus job retention scheme. Thank you. Hi Avril, just put your mic on, remember, just to get your mic on. So, sorry about that. Um, I'll start again. So, my thanks very much Shona. My name is Avril Craig and I'm the manager of payroll services at MHA Henderson Loggy. So what I'm going to cover off today, um, I'm going to emphasise some of the important points that came up in our last webinar. Um, and if you want more details on these, you can re-watch the last webinar, it's recorded and there's frequently asked question document shown on our website too. I'd also like to clarify a couple of points that were discussed in the last webinar. We've been asked about these a lot, so probably I didn't make the facts clear enough, so I'm going to go over them again. And lastly, and quite importantly, I'm going to highlight the latest HMRC updates which have come to us over the last couple of days. So first of all, just in a very brief format, the process you follow when you have employees to furlough is you designate who the furloughed employees are, you communicate with them, you pay them and then you reclaim. That's the cycle that you follow. It's really important that you keep good records of all of this, all your employee communications, signed agreements and everything for five years. During the furlough process and the discussions and everything, remember that employment law still stands. So be really careful about the decision making process, um, particularly in deciding who is a furloughed employee. It might be necessary to take HR or legal guidance, but make sure that you've got yourself covered. Um, lastly, please remember that your claims at some point in the future will be checked. So every decision you make, please justify. And I've written that word justify down three times. Have good notes and good criteria, good rationale for all the decisions that you're making. So on to a couple of points that were raised in the webinar that I'd like to go over again. One is about furlough periods. A furlough period is a minimum of three weeks. So it can be three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, etc. And these are continuous weeks. It can't be two weeks or it can, but you won't get any funding for that period. If your employee is on furlough for let's say three weeks and then you bring them back to work for a week and then you put them on furlough again that second period of furlough is also a minimum of three weeks so the clock starts again when it comes to holidays your employee can take holidays during a furlough period but they must be paid 100 percent of their pay but you can only reclaim um, a maximum of 80% of their wage as at the 20th of February, or if they're a higher paid employee, the 2,500 cap maximum applies. I'd like to go over some important updates that we've had from HMRC. Now, the first one is regarding employees who weren't on your payroll as at the 28th of February. So um, this is quite tricky 
you might have to read this a couple of times to understand what it's all about. There's been a bit of a relaxation, so you now must have reported earnings for the 1920 tax year by the 19th of March in order for a furloughed employee to qualify for funding. This is what the guidance says. You can only claim for furloughed employees that were on your payroll on or before the 19th of March 2020 and which were notified to HMRC on an RTI submission on or before the 19th of March 2020. So there's a bit of confusion here, but what this means is this will help some people with say weekly or four weekly payrolls, see where the payroll cutoff is mid-March. But for any monthly payrolls that reported February starters in the March payroll, they are still excluded. Now, for claiming your furlough grant, you have to have a PYE online account. If you've got one in place, that's great. You're ready to reclaim. If you don't have a PYE online account, you need one to make online claims. When you set up your account, an activation code will be sent to you. Usually these are sent by post, but now they're going to come by email, which is really going to help people who are unable to go to their workplace to collect mail. So that's one bit of good news from HMRC. Now, when you're re processing your payment claim, when the portal is open, which we expect to be the 20th of April, if you have less than 100 employees for LOD, your claim data is unfortunately going to have to be keyed into the portal. Um, so I imagine that to be name, national insurance number, employee number, and so on. So this could end up being quite a laborious task. We had rather hoped this would take the form of a CSV file upload, but no such luck at the moment. It's possible that might change, but at the moment, that's the process as it stands. Now, we await some further guidance and some further clarification on some matters. Um, one thing is how to work out a claim for a variable paid employee where there's a part month. So if this is someone who's maybe on a zero hours contract and they were furloughed on the 23rd of March, how do we work out the furlough pay for the remainder of the month? Um, you, you can do it on working days, you can do it on calendar days. Again, I think this goes back to the justify, you know, find good rationale and good justification for your decisions. But we're hoping that we'll get further clarity on this. We don't know yet how the NIC secondary threshold applies to part pay periods. And we also are still waiting some clarification on the reclaim of pension uh, contributions, the minimum 3%. There's also clarifications to come on salary sacrifice schemes. Um, if you're looking for your agent, i.e. us, to do your reclaims, um, we expect that the 64A authorisation is sufficient to allow this to happen. But again, we are still waiting for clarification on this matter. As I've mentioned, and as I mentioned in my last, on the last webinar, things are changing daily. So please, please watch our website for further updates and refer to the frequently asked questions on the website, re-watch the webinar, and we'll always keep you up to date. So that's all from me just now. I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Fiona Doctor. Thank you, Avril. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fiona Doctor. I'm the HR Director for MHA Henderson Logie. I head up our HR team, which provides both internal and external HR support. The outbreak of coronavirus has certainly thrown up all kinds of issues and challenges around workforce planning. From the introduction of furloughing and supporting staff to adapt to remote working, 
to upskilling and redeploying staff, as well as considering longer term and more difficult measures such as redundancy. As, I, as Avril mentioned, uh, one of the key HR updates this week is that the payroll date for employees to be eligible for the furlough scheme has been extended to the 19th of March 2020. This may mean that depending on your payroll cycles, some of the workforce planning decisions you have made to date may need to be revisited and considered afresh in light of this change. As most of us are aware, the job retention scheme was introduced as a temporary measure for a period of three months, starting from 1st of March 2020, to support those employers who could not maintain their current workforce because their operations were severely affected by the outbreak. As things stand, the scheme is due to end on the 31st of May 2020, although at the time of implementation, the government did indicate that it might be extended beyond that date. Given that the 31st of May is approximately six weeks away, business are, businesses are rightly now beginning to turn their attention to what is going to happen at the end of May 2020, so that they can start to plan accordingly. We don't know at this stage when the lockdown will be lifted, and certainly Matt Hancock made it clear yesterday that the lockdown will only be lifted when it is safe to do so. We are, however, expecting further guidance to be made available in the coming days, and certainly organisations and unions such as the CBI and the TUC have made the government aware of the pressing need for an update on this issue now. Some of you may have picked up in the press this week that the CBI are pushing for the government to provide an update on planned extension to the coronavirus job retention scheme. The CBI are concerned that some businesses may be forced into a position where they have to make people redundant if the government doesn't confirm any extension of the job retention scheme. The reason the CBI are flagging it up this week is that if companies are to comply with the minimum 45 day consultation period required for redundancies of more than 100 employees, employers would need to start their formal procedures this Saturday, the 18th of April. It is also worth noting at this point that employers making between 20 and 99 people redundant must also follow a collective consultation period of at least 30 days. Clarity is therefore vital for businesses to start planning accordingly, and the CBI are hopeful that the government will be able to provide the clarity on this point very soon. Until we know more, it is important to plan for various scenarios, as David outlined earlier. The CIPD, which is the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, have created a workforce planning tool which may help you to navigate some of the complex issues you may face if there is a need to reduce your workforce. It highlights a range of short term and longer term workforce planning strategies which may be helpful to feed into your scenario planning process. If you Google CIPD you will be able to access the website and tool that way. The CIPD are issuing guidance on Friday around planning the next steps beyond furlough. Whilst it will not provide answers to the key questions such as will the job retention scheme be extended and if so, how long for, it aims to give employers an understanding of the options available to them following furlough, as well as an insight into the potential fair processes employers will need to follow to unfurlough staff, particularly if they are doing this on a phased return basis. We will update the coronavirus section of our website with any helpful guidance. To wrap up, these are unprecedented and uncertain times. Employees will be fearful about what happens next and will also be aware of the 31st of May 2020 deadline, particularly those who have been furloughed. A couple of points you may wish to consider if you haven't already. Make sure you communicate frequently with all, all employees to keep them updated with what's going on within the business. And if there are any proposed changes to your company's furlough process or other company policies, such as your approach to annual leave requests or sickness absence. Ensure the communication is a two way process, which will also help you understand how your employees are doing and help you identify if there are any particular issues you need to address. The second point I would make is consider your employees' well-being. Signpost your employees to further advice or support, 
such as your employee assistance programme if you have one, or other free wellbeing resources such as Mind, the NHS or Headspace, which gives access to physical and mental health guidance. I will leave you with one final thought. Case studies from China have shown that those employers who engaged with their workforce and supported them throughout the difficult periods have had the most success when reopening again for business. Thank you. I will now hand you back to David Smith. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so we'll move on to the, the live question and answer session just now. A good number of questions have come through. Uh, some of the questions that you've asked have already been covered in the, in the presentation, so hopefully for, for those of you who have asked those questions, you've picked up those answers. Um, just the first question then uh, for Rod, um, do we think there will be an increase in mergers and acquisitions as a result of the, the crisis? Yeah, th thanks, David. I think probably in the short term, um, m and &E activity is probably going to be limited. Um, but, you know, we, we are seeing transactions in, in particular sectors, for example, healthcare and technology um, are, are still active. Um, I, think, I think in the medium term, uh, m and &E, there will be a lot of activity um, and that will be driven by a number of things. I think firstly, distressed m and &E. Um, so business owners who think that the only, the only alternative is really to go and speak to Shona um, uh, with, a, with a dark cloak on. So the, the only alternative is to, is to sell and, and you know, maybe to get a bit of value um, with the alternative being uh, you know, you know, closing the business. So I think, I think that's going to drive activity in the medium term. Uh, I think secondly, you know, there will be buyers who, who, are, who are in a strong position at the moment who have got you know, um, significant reserves who will be looking for acquisitions, probably more on an opportun opportunistic basis. So I think that will drive M and activity. Um, and I think finally, I think business owners who um, you know had maybe been thinking about selling over the last couple of years, uh, and as as a result of this last you know last few, few weeks and months, um, are probably just going to get fed up uh, and decide to sell. So I think I think there's 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 certain dynamics that will will create a lot of M and activity over the next. Uh, over, over, the, over the medium term, but what, what we'd say is that good businesses, uh, and as I said earlier, um, you know, good businesses might at the end of this process be actually better businesses, more efficient businesses because they've looked, you know, closely at their costs um, uh, and their structure. Um, and you know, to sell to sell now will probably uh, result in, in a lower value. So maybe the advice is to is to to keep going, come out the other side, um, and then think of a sale when things get back to normal. Hope that answers that question. Thanks for that, Rod. Uh, super. Um, immediately before uh, coming on the webinar, I was uh, speaking on the phone to one of our furloughed members of staff. So that, this is maybe a good question to ask my head of HR, Fiona. Um, should you be communicating with furloughed members of staff? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, whilst um, uh, employees are on furlough leave, they are, they are obviously still very much employed business, but uh, employed by the business uh, and uh, remain employees of the business. You also need to think about, um, you know, the impact of individuals being on furlough leave and when they actually then come back into the business. So the more you communicate with them, the more that they are kept engaged throughout the, the process, uh, the better. Uh, and certainly, you know, what, what we're doing as a business, we are engaging regularly both uh, by, by telephone uh, and also through the use of social media tools such as Workplace to keep everyone informed of what's happening within the business. Hope that answers that question. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, super. Um, actually, the next question that's come up, it's somebody for, from our team who hasn't actually appeared on the webinar yet, but, but I know it, it is here, Jacqueline Watson, our, our marketing director. Should you be marketing your business just now? Yeah, that's a, a good question, uh, David, and one that I've been asked a lot over um, the past uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, and I've seen a lot of commentary out there which has suggested that you should just batten down the hatches, you should just get ready to reopen it, that you should not be uh, marketing during this time. Um, but but I would certainly um, advise um, against that. I think this is not the time to be switching off your communication to your um, to your customers and to your uh, stakeholders, like Shona was mentioning earlier. 
Um, I think this is a, potentially a really good time to show the more human side to your brand. Um, and I definitely think on um, social media channels, those posts and information which are which are shown the more human side to brands are um, are definitely performing um, a lot better than maybe some of the other posts. And uh, what I would say is some businesses have said to me, you know, I don't have anything to say and I'm really concerned about what I do say and the tone in which I say it. And, you know, we've not really got a lot to say right now. Um, and I think what I would say is try and think about um, what you can share about what your customers are doing or your stakeholders are doing or your employees and their families are doing. What are they doing in terms of community spirit? Are they involved in anything in the their own local communities that you could be sharing? Because those are the kind of posts and uh, messages that are doing really well just now. So whilst it might be limited in terms of what you might want to say for your business, um, I think getting out a lot of community messages um, is a really positive thing to do right now. And um, finally, I, I would say that if you um, if you you know care about a particular cause and if you've been really active in that in previous years, now is not the time to 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 stop communicating about that message. Now is the time to show that you do really care about that particular cause um, and to to engage with those messages just now. So um, hopefully that answers that question. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, that's a really good answer to, to that. And the next one is actually again for Rod. Uh, what do you do if a key member of your team is off ill, perhaps in your finance team? Can you recruit somebody temporarily to fill the role? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I think I think the short answer is is yes. And you know, particularly you know, if it, if it's a, a member of your finance team, um, you know, it would be tempting to to not replace them. Um, at the moment because there's additional costs. But as I said earlier, the, the important thing during this time and you know, if you're thinking about applying for a loan, for example, um, is the ability to generate financial information and good quality financial information. So I would encourage you to, to replace that, that, that employee. I, I don't think there's any HR issues around that, um, you know, to, to, to replace somebody temporarily. And I would say that, you know, that's something that we, we could help with you know, by providing an outsourced service. But um, uh, yeah, I think the answer is yes, yes, do that. And I'd encourage you to do it. OK, th thanks very much, Rod. Um, another one for uh, this time for Avril. We run weekly and monthly payroll. Do you have to claim together or separately through the portal? Okay, I can answer this based on what we know so far because we don't actually have access to the portal. But how I understand it from what we know, um, it will be separate claims for separate pay periods because weekly um, payrolls are, pay, are claimed weekly, monthly, monthly payrolls are claimed monthly and so on because you have to enter the employee details and the pay period and so on. Um, I actually think it will be easier to manage if you do it on separate um, pay periods. But so based on the guidance at the moment, yes, it's separate claims for separate periods. Super, th thanks very much, Avril. Um, Rod, uh, we're getting our money's worth from you this morning. Um, so next one for you, Rod. I've heard that lots of businesses are not getting approved for C bills. What more can you do to gain approval? Yeah, I think um, I, I heard, heard a, an interesting statistic last week that 130,000 applications have been made um, for C bills across the UK uh, and a thousand have been approved. So that's less than 1%. Um, but that, that obviously takes into account businesses that were just not viable in the first place applying uh, on, on the off chance. Uh, and, and secondly, um, you know, current applications that are being being assessed at the moment. But I think going back to what I said earlier, that you know, that it's important that you you plan your application properly um, and really take into account what the lenders are looking for. And I think the two key things they're looking for is firstly that the business was viable before COVID nineteen hit, um, and secondly that the business is going to be viable going forward after COVID nineteen. 
um, and will be able to, to service any additional debt that the, that the company takes on. So short, short answer to that is, um, you know, really, you know, put, put in a strong lending proposition. Don't just don't just fire information into the bank um, to let them work it out. Um, actually put a, a, a proposition that answers their questions um, before they before they ask them. Hope that helps. Thanks very much, Rod. Thank you. Um, just a couple more that, that have come in just, just now. So Fiona, this one for you. If a holiday is taken while on furlough, does this reset the furlough period, i.e. would a three week period be deemed to restart? Um, holidays have been one of the, the most debated, uh, debated rather issues, um, I think, uh, around the, the job retention scheme and certainly uh, when it was first announced, um, the, the guidance was clear that no holidays should be taken. However, um, HMRC uh, and ACAS um, subsequently clarified that holidays could be taken whilst an individual was off on furlough leave, so it can be taken during a period of furlough. Um, and, and doesn't necessarily then reset that furlough period. Uh, as Avril mentioned earlier, uh, any any period of, of holiday should be paid at 100%. Uh, so if someone is off on furlough, then the employer would have to top up that extra uh, 20% based on current guidance. OK, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, as they come through just now, there's a couple that are similar that maybe Avril you can pick up on um, around average earnings calculations. So the first question, if, if average earnings work out at less than current standard earnings, do you still have to use the average earnings calculation? Thinking about the scenario when standard wages have increased as a, as a result of the national living wage increase on the 1st of April and also do you have to use the same calculation for all furloughed employees, i.e. average wages or standard contracted hours? Thanks, David. OK, I'll look at the first question. Um, the average earnings calculation is based on for fixed uh, cont fixed hour employees. It's based on their salary or the wages as at the 28th of February. If they're varying pay employees, it's based on their average over the last year or the same, how much they got paid for the same pay period last year, so the higher of those two. And I know it's counterintuitive to pay less than the current national minimum wage or national living wage, but you have to remember that you're not paying them for services, you're just paying an average amount of a historic payment. And 80% or 100% of that, whatever you choose to pay. So you can almost forget the living, the national minimum wage or national living wage while someone's, someone is furloughed. Um, you can choose to pay more if you want to, but remember you, this, these average calculations, that's what your reclaim is limited, limited to. So if you want to pay the full wage and you know take the hit for that extra cost, then there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, do you have to use the same calculation for all furloughed employees? Um, again, what you pay is one thing and what you reclaim is another thing. So when we're working out how much you're reclaiming, you have to use the calculations that are set down by HMRC and it's for fixed hour employees. As I said, it refers to their wage as of the 20th of February. For variable paid employees, it refers to the higher of their average wage over the 1920 tax year and their wage for the same period last year. So those rules apply to everyone for the reclaim. Again, what you pay them is up to you. Think that's me. That's super. Thanks okay. very much, Avril. Um, just checking whether uh, there's anything else coming in. Just there was one question uh, which I'll answer, which was, are we planning to do more webinars? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the traffic to our website continues to be exceptionally busy and there's lots of questions being sent to us. Um, so we're going to use that as our indicator to decide on future topics. 
Uh, and also, uh, as uh, all the presenters have talked about today, that the, the guidance from HMRC and the government and their plans continue to, to be updated and, and uh, finessed or changed. Um, so as that happens and, and we feel that there's a need to, to get more information to you to help you get through this situation, then uh, we will continue to run webinars uh, and uh, we'll continue to do that while there's a big demand. I'll just check on the questions whether, whether there's any more that, that we can answer just now. Um, just let me pop into the box again. Um, Shona, I wonder, is, is this one that you can pick up? Um, the question is, what is the extent of work that a furloughed director can do? Yeah, so I... Uh, I've got, yeah, OK, so I think the as I understand it, you, you, you can furlough a director. Director shouldn't be taking part in anything of the sort of that day to day running of the business. But what they can do is continue with the statutory duties now, uh, you know, at, at the sort of the most basic level, I guess that, you know, make sure your accounts are submitted on time and that you, you, you're doing your, your annual returns to to company's house. But I think on a more practical level, you know, it, it is about, you know, taking steps to, um, you know, if you've got if you've got debtors out there, then, you know, pursuing those debtors wouldn't um, come under that. Dealing with your employees, if you've got employees, I, I think, you know, take away from the, what, what you actually do as a business to more that the, the um, executive role as a, a business leader, I, I guess. Um, so I don't know if um, anyone else uh, in my team is any more on that, um, but I think it is an area that there has been a lack of clarity around. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you, Shona. There's definitely a lack of clarity, um, but uh, I think I think we try and do what's right and, and what we feel is in, in, the, in the spirit of the guidelines guidelines that, that we've got in front of us. Um, may, maybe one more question. There's quite a lot of very specific questions, and, and I'll, I'll suggest that maybe you pick up directly with, with one of the team afterwards if you've if you've got a very specific question um but but avril just the, the last one perhaps and uh, you might have to do this thinking off the top of your head can we claim for april furlough from the 20th of april when the system goes live so i think, I think that's you know for, for the april payroll uh for the stuff that furloughed can, can you make that claim on the 20th of april when the when the portal hopefully opens Yes, OK. Um, theoretically, yes, you can. I've no idea what the website's going to be like. Um, I think the whole world will be trying to claim on the 20th of April. Um, but yes, you can You can claim ahead of payday. That's super, Avril. Th thank you for that. As I say, that there, there's lots of uh, very specific questions coming through, so, so I'd suggest that that those ones um, come, come to us directly uh, and, and we, we, we can reply to you. Um, we'll wrap things up there. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm conscious that uh, everybody's got much, much to do. So I'll let you get back to, to uh, your computers and to your calls and, and to your meetings. Um, thank you very much to our presenters for uh, the insight this morning. Uh, it's a very fast moving situation and uh, lots of thinking on your feet and, and uh, keeping everybody up to date. Um, we're going to upload this video so you can watch it again and focus on it, any elements that were key to the situation that you're facing. If you've got specific questions on managing your cash flow, practical steps uh, for VAT for, for cash flow or restructuring, then please do, do speak to Rod, Alan or Shona directly. Um, speak to some of the other team members if, with, with specific questions that, that you, you've heard on the webinar today. Avril's payroll team are cracking on with processing our clients' payrolls this month and to help them to be able to focus on that, um, we have our employers advisory team on hand to help with questions that you have on the coronavirus job retention scheme and on submitting claims on your behalf. Um, so their contact email address is up on the screen there for you, employer advisory team at hlca.co.uk. So that would be the first port of call for most questions and that will leave Avril and our team to actually make sure that we get all your payrolls processed this month. Um, but we, we, are, we are strengthening that team by the day, our employer advisory team, just to, to cope with uh, the demands that, 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 that uh, you're pushing our way and helping you through this. 
Um, some last words of advice from the team that you've heard it through, through the presenters and, and from me. You've really got to stay strong through this period, maintain your energy levels and that, and that will rub off on, on your teams as well. That see that you as leaders are, are maintaining your energy and, and guiding them through these troubled times. Be proactive, we said a number of times. You can only control what you can control. Um, but, but remember, you can control things and, and that way you feel that you've got a bit of power. Um, my favourite quote, and I've been, I've been saying this for, for a number of years inside our own business, it's from Theodore Roosevelt. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. And the next best thing is the wrong thing. But the worst thing you can do is nothing. So make decisions, don't procrastinate. Thanks everybody and speak soon. Take care, stay healthy. Bye now.